right um, so this is um, carrier ethernet <coughs> why are we talking about carrier ethernet because these technologies were developed for the carriers but now they are used inside the data center so all of these things if we are just talking about data center or data center virtualization or anything like that you will find they are all inside because data centers have become so big that things that were developed for carriers what is a carrier in the first place carrier is a telephone company which really connects people in a in multiple cities or you know are in the same city at different places <coughs> what are the technologies <coughs> first what are the legacy technologies for data center interconnection those are called pdh sdh mpls pwe3 we will talk about those then some new services have been developed called metro ethernet services there is a second part third part is administration and management of these services and then extensions ethan so they, these are the services but it doesn't mean it doesn't say how the ethernet can do that so for that ethernet has been extended by ieee so we talk about those extensions q and q q and q mac and mac and pbbte and so all of these they said are originally for the for the for the carriers the problem is as follows we have two campuses maybe two data centers and we need to connect them now nobody can cross the street you cannot dig the street and start putting wires through even if you have two houses across the street that is public property so the only people who have license to do that are the carriers carriers have contacted with the state city or whatever to be able to you know provide connections and they have actually in some sense monopoly for that reason all right so you have nine options as listed here if you wanted to connect two campuses one is that you get the optical fiber obviously you cannot dig the street and put optical fiber there so you have to get it from the telephone company which is another name for the carrier right and it's very expensive so what you do is you say well i don't want a full fiber give me a piece of the fiber which means one wavelength uh, actually before i go to the wavelength there is something different now coming up it's called optical transport network otn otn is actually a network of fibers so you get a path through a network of fibers the fibers connected to a switch where the carriers can program as to which fiber where the light comes out where it goes it's called otn so otn is a switched fiber network third thing you can get is a wavelength so you say well i don't need the whole fiber but give me one of those 20 wavelengths you have on that fiber one color so other customers can use the same fiber so you pay pay less all right if you can't even afford a wavelength which most of us cannot then you get what we call a sonnet link <coughs> sdh synchronous digital hierarchy this is a link and um, we will actually talk about it in a minute and that is is still not in the reach of you and me but probably washu can pay for it and probably washu has a link actually at 155 megabit between the two campuses after that if you can't afford that then you go down the list and you go to pdh <coughs> and we will talk about that too also that is cheaper and the lower speed and then not by cheapness but you know some of the new options are mpls to use pseudo wire over mpls to use microwave and then to use dsl that's what we can afford actually maybe dsl if you have a small business maybe you can get a dsl here and dsl there and you are connected but dsl is not really going to take you much speed very you know, limited but this is high high speed dsl they have this, they have they have basically designed decently so that might do and then finally you can just use the ethernet the thing is that inside the campus you have none of these technologies inside the campus all you have is ethernet right and you want to connect to ethernet switches and you have to go through all these other technologies so the ethernet guys said why don't we just connect by the ethernet all the way through and that's what this lecture is about what has been designed as services of the ethernet and what has what new protocols or new frame formats or new features have been developed in ethernet to be able to do this
depends upon the technology. See, thing is, if you have a fiber, you don't, you can send whatever you want, any anything you want on this fiber, right? It doesn't have to be IP packet. It could be just Ethernet pack, Ethernet frame. If you do MPLS, then you have to, you know, MPLS. You will then we'll talk about actually MPLS. We'll talk about. So you'll see what you do to to send it Ethernet frame over MPLS. But these things, you know, for example, for each of these, there is some definition by the people who design the protocols for that. Okay. So, for example, for OTN, there is a definition how you send Ethernet frame over OTN. There is a definition for DWDM. And I'm not going to go through that one because that is not relevant here. There is a definition for SONET. There is a definition for PDH, MPLS, microwave, everything. So, so whenever you want to send something, you know, people have to say, well, how do you send it over that thing? Right? So we'll talk about <coughs> actually MPLS more and a little bit about this SDH and PDH. So you'll see. So let's start with PDH. The reason we are starting with PDH is because PDH came first. This is the oldest technology around. Basically, in the beginning, everybody had a phone wire to their home going all the way to the central place, telephone company's head office. And that wire ran at 64 kilobits. Why? Because they did some survey and found out that if they do 4,000 samples a second and play it back, the sound is reasonable. Actually, four, sorry, not 4,000 samples. 4 kilohertz sound is reasonable. 4, 000, 4 kilo, for 4 kilohertz, you have to take 8,000 samples per, minute, per second. Remember Nyquist, um, you, have to, you have to sample at twice the frequency. So, to get 4,000 kilohertz voice, you need to sample at 8,000 samples per second and each sample is 8 bit and that also is determined by survey because nowadays we, if you want to listen music, the telephone quality is not good. So you really need more than 8 bits and you need more than 8,000 samples per second. But anyway, 8,000 samples, 8 bit per sample gives you 64 kilobits per second. So. 64 kilobit is the what is what is what you call the telephone voice, and that was the only thing they wanted to send. They didn't want to send any data. I mean, they just want to send the voice. So all the telephone circuitry from then till today has been designed for voice for that reason is a multiple of 64 kilobit. And so when they wanted to connect two offices, they said, "Well, you want to carry 24 voice circuits on one wire, and that wire will run at 24 times." 24 times 64, that would be 1.544 kilobits, and that is called T1, trunk line 1, T1. All right, and T1, you can, T1, and then if you if you want to carry more, then you got T2, and T3, and so on and so forth. All right, and they, they were not very nicely designed as powers of 2s or anything, whatever happened to happen to them, they basically, so you can see that 24, you go four times, and here you go five times, you know. So somehow, you know, it's, it, it cannot just, you just have to remember these numbers, and which we do. <coughs> T1 is 1.5, T3 is 45, like that, you know, because those are the two numbers we use. T2, we don't use that much. Then in Europe, and it is the thing, the first things you start in ESA, and they are somewhat not organized well, but in Europe, by the time they get there, they, they have time to think and organize it well. So they went with EU, different system, which is E1, and E1 has 32 channels. Of course, they took the 64 kilobits, although their 64 kilobit is slightly different than ours, but the, the, the rate is same, but the but some things are different. Anyway, so 64 kilobits, they took 32, that became E1, and then 2 raised to, that is 2 raised to 5, 2 raised to 8 is E2, and so on and so forth. So they have E1, E2, E3, and the rest of the world actually I think has that. North America is the only place. Now what is North America? North America is Mexico here in Canada. Why? Because, and why we have the same system? Because AT&T was the company. 
in all three countries. All right. So in these three countries, which is North America, we have area code, country code one. Canada has the same country code as Mexico as in uh, USA. Because we had one telephone company, which was AT&T. All right. So the rest of the world uses E1s. We use T1s. So basically, putting several wires worth of traffic into one wire. So you do have to, you know, somehow compress the bits. <laughs> All right, and then there you have to put some framing so that you know that nothing has been lost. You know, some bits go around. So there's a whole detail that we don't need to get here. Actually, um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, in some version of 470, not I think not recently, but in original courses we used to teach all this. But nowadays, T1 etc are going away. But anyway, so this was as you can see, this is yeah. So you take these 24 people's one byte each, and you put 24 bytes. And you have transmitted in in the same time, you know, basically eight thousand times a second. Then they needed even more number of circuits to be connected because once they wanted to go wanted to go across the city or they wanted to connect with another carrier, which was actually MCI. Then at and wanted to connect to MCI. They said, okay, let's connect by optical fiber, and they came up with a system for connecting with the optical fiber, which was called SONET, synchronous optical network, synchronous optical network. Basically, synchronous optical network, this is the standard for digital optical transmission. <coughs> then it was standardized by ANC and then by ITU. When, once it went to ITU, ITU is heavily dominated by Europeans and therefore the system was changed. And so they came out, what they came out from there is called SDH, synchronous digital hierarchy, which is different than SONET but similar, just like T1 and E1 are similar, but different. So what is this, what does SONET do? And now SONET has been very successful. SONET has been very successful that it's, it's been so successful that anybody who wants to go and talk to a carrier, they have to say, well, can you do as good as SONET? If you can't, then don't talk to me. And so Ethernet guys had to do the same thing. And as we will see in a minute. So before we see what Ethernet guys have done, let's see what SONET can do. So first of all, SONET is a ring, dual ring, right? And you have these SONET um, boxes. And um, so we saw this kind of ring before, where if some fiber gets cut, you just wrap around and you, you know, within 50 milliseconds, SONET can wrap around and be in business. So your, your telephone line is disconnected. You won't even notice the telephone line got disconnected. So that is the first thing is protection. Second thing is fast restoration. So it can do that in 50 milliseconds. Sophisticated management. And you can change things around sitting in the network management center and there are ways to find out where the faults are and things like that. So it's, it's a very sophisticated management. And it is ideal for voice. By the way, SONET is simply optical fiber with the fixed rate coming in, fixed rate going out. So there is no compression, there is no queuing anywhere. It's all circuit switched. Your line is coming in. It is switched with some people who are going all are going to Kansas City. You go with them and the Kansas City it will be given to people where you're calling, right? So so basically everything is circuit switched. There is no queuing and that is good for the voice. Voice doesn't like latency, delays, loss, nothing. There is nothing here. Okay? And guaranteed delay because it is mostly propagation delay. How much light will take from here to go and get there? You know, SONET will get there in that time. The rates are multiples of 51.84 megabits. So OC1 is 51.84, OC3 is three times that, which is 155, OC12 is 12 times 51, is 622, and so on and so forth. Now, this we remember. Particularly those of us who are in the business of, you know, all this stuff, I mean, and I was at some point, is that basically it is 50, 51.84, instead of 51.84, you just remember 50, so when somebody says OC12, you just say, oh, 622, because 50 times 12 is somewhere around 600, 622. Similarly, for OC192, 192 divided by 2 is 96, so we know it's 9.6 gigabit. Thing like that. So basically roughly by 50 megabits we remember. OC3 is 155, 622 and so on and so forth. So these are 
multiples of threes and fours. The problem with that is that if you want to send Ethernet, it doesn't match. So let's say you want to send 10 megabits, you can't really use OC1, that would be just too much, too expensive. Right? So you let it take 5 10 megabits, still that doesn't match with 51.84. And if you want to send 100 megabits, again you are in the same trouble, gigabit and so on and so forth, 10 gigabit. And so the net rates that the data people adopt, they are not there in the carrier world. <coughs> so it was a problem both ways. Problem for the data people, because you want to send something and the carriers cannot sell it to you. And you want to sell something to the carriers and carriers doesn't want it because you don't have the rates that they want. Okay, so it was a problem both ways. Data people cannot send their sell their equipment to carriers, and carriers cannot sell their services to the data people. So some compromise was stuck. So back in the days when they were designing 10 mega 10 gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet can run at 9.5 gigabit. You know why? Because that is what the carriers give you. So they said, okay, that is 10 gigabit, good enough. Round number. So, <clears throat> so basically 10 gigabit runs at two speeds, either at 10 or 9.5. Things like that are happening nowadays. So nowadays they are merging. The carriers are buying the data equipment and the data equipment people are, are buying carrier services. So that, that is merging, but in the beginning it was not. Second thing is these rates are static. And so when you get an OC1 line, 51.84, you got to use it or lose it. If you don't use it, you are paying monthly anyway, fixed rate. And um, and so if you have bursty traffic and sometimes you need 5 megabits, sometimes you need 50 gigabit, that's that's no help because they, they don't they don't store anything. They don't buffer anything. Right? So that was a mismatch again. Third thing is that whenever they came up with the method of carrying anything, they had only one one thing to carry, that was the voice. And they were very well done in, right? So they said, okay, all right, we can carry Ethernet packets. So they designed that, but now the whole thing, whole 51.84 megabit, megabits have to be filled with Ethernet frames. You cannot put some Ethernet frames, some ATM cells, and some frame relay frames, and some IP frames. You cannot just mix and match because payload type is only one for the whole link. So unlike in the Ethernet or the data world, where the first frame has the Ethernet in it, other frame has IP in it, third frame has something else, because they're frame by frame, right? Here there's no, no such thing as circuit. And so the whole circuit carries one thing. So, so, so there were all kinds of difficulties. All right. And so Sonnet SDH is still used, but but basically it is suitable only for very high paying customers, for very high speed, and for very high guarantees. So for example, Vashu, if I am able to go and double check, probably has an OC3 link, which is very common. You know, big companies have OC3 link connecting their offices. OC3 is 155, and um, between the two campuses. <coughs> 